I'm Christy Hemingway, host of Ed Curation, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of My Ed Tech Life. I am excited to be here with you all on this wonderful Tuesday, or it may be it may be Wednesday, depending on where in the world you may be. Thank you, as always, for making My Ed Tech Life a part of your day. Thank you always for your support as well. Thank you for all the likes, shares, and follows. Please make sure you continue to share the podcast with all of your friends. But tonight, I am really excited because this is definitely a show that was a, a long time in the making, and we finally um, were able to make it happen. And I am so excited today to have Mr. Kevin Shia on the show today. So I'm just really, really excited because today we're going to be talking about AR, VR, and we're going to be talking about some of the amazing work that he is doing. And of course, where the technology is going and what he sees, you know, being in the forefront of this, where he sees this continuing to go and continue to grow into. So Kevin, how are you doing this evening? I am doing amazing, Alfonso. And what that was a pretty professional intro, uh, pretty sick. So I'm going to start off by saying that was really rad. I think I was like dancing in the background there. I was like, hey, let's keep this music going. This is a <laughs> DJ session now, but I'm doing fantastic, man. Hope you are the same. Excellent. Yes, I sure am. And like I said, very excited that we get to talk today. I know that we've kind of known each other just you know through the Twitter space and then we got to meet once many moons ago at TCEA and of course you've been very busy doing a lot of work in the AR VR space but it's just been great to be able to see what you're doing and what you continue to do so I'm really excited to dive in into all of this work and again like I said getting your perspective on the AR VR space so Kevin if you don't mind for our audience members that may be joining us and are getting to know you today for the very first time, can you give us a brief introduction and your context in education and maybe in the AR space as well? Yeah, so um, I'll just say that I've only been in the education space for a couple of years. I was actually in post-production working on the studios for like 15 plus years. And when I was working as the executive director at Sony, uh, my job was to engage with uh, anything VR and then uh, augmented reality related as well. Uh, during that time, that's when PSVR was just launching. So I was getting into like the VR space, whichever. But one of the cool things was me to monitor technologies and to help out different groups, like the licensing marketing groups and whatever. And actually, uh, in a meeting, I met um, Andrew Trinket and uh, Franklin Lyons. And if you know them, they're the creators of Verge. And I remember getting the cube and then taking it home, just trying to, I thought it was cool because one of the things about augmented reality uh, at the time was just you point click and you kind of just like placed your camera in front of it where they had a tangible object you could manipulate. I'm like, wow, that's that's kind of new and kind of cool. Let me kind of test it out. And, um, you know, because of that and having home the weekend, that was kind of the genesis of me creating the app Moment AR, which we'll probably talk about a little bit. But to fast forward a little bit, yes, uh, I created an app in the social emotional learning space. Um, and I co-created with my wife as a school psychologist for the Burbank District, go Burbank. Um, and in the past couple of years, probably uh, uh, more notably due to COVID, I've been teaching senior software design at Cal State Northridge. So I would say because of this Merge Cube right here, not only did it give me the education space as well, but I'm also teaching it um, at the same time. So that's pretty cool. Nice. That's wonderful, man. So we're definitely going to dive in because, as you know, one of my favorite parts of this show is, number one, getting some amazing guests such as yourself. But number two, I always tell my guests, I always consider anybody that is sitting right across from me, well, here, you know, remotely, as a superhero, somebody that I look up to, some of the work that they've done, how influential it has been, not only in my practice, but just to continue to learn where, you know, trends are and, of course, the technology is going. So as in the superhero, they all have an origin story. So, Kevin, if you don't mind, can you share a little bit of your origin story as far as how the, you know, what your passion was that led you into working into studios and then, of course, leading up to getting into AR, VR? Yeah, you know, um, I think the passion I got into, and I think it was accidentally wrangled into it, um, years and years, many moons ago, when this wasn't a 40-year-old face, um, was right after college, I um, started at Warner Brothers, and they actually switched the job on me on the last minute. 
um, and they put me into data wrangling, which is just you're taking care of data um, in through the facility. But from there, I started to learn how to code. And of course, I had a computer science degree, uh, but I did really know how to use it in the workplace. And that's and I kind of learned how to code from there. And um, working on post production and video production, I learned about color correctors, uh, which is you know too long didn't read. It's more of just like the video you see on your screens is how it proceeds on the uh, theaters and stuff as well as that's how they color correct. Um, but I really got into like the engineering aspect of it. Um, and I've been doing that for years of just being like this engineer, like always tinkering and fixing things. So, you know, it kind of worked well when I got introduced to Andrew and Franklin and got a merge cube as well, because when I met with my wife, she was just like, Hey, I have this problem. And I'm like, Hey, I think I have something I can tinker with, you know, and get something working for you. So it's almost like my whole vast 15 plus year history um, led me all down this trough to hear of like, that's the great thing I'm doing at. Like I've engineer engineer's mentality. So if you need to build anything, fix anything or whatever, like my job, people hire me to do that right, right now. So that's kind of like my superhero genesis of it. of just like always been an engineer, came into the education sector, saw a problem, brought a solution. And it just so happened to be a really good solution. That's wonderful. And like I yeah. said, you know, you had that background and of course, computer science and so on. Now, you know, going back a little bit further, as far as like maybe your, you know, K through 12 uh, experience, was there anything there already that you already said, you know what, this is, or maybe somehow along the line that would tie into what you're currently doing as far as that passion where you like into video games or was it something like you said, that engineering mindset, just always being a critical thinker, trying to find solutions to problems? One I would say, Alfonso, is how dare you make me go that far? I'm not, my brain is not a time machine. But yeah, you know what? When I was a kid, yeah, the normal video games and sports. But I think the biggest thing is once you hit high school, you know, and you have to start being an adult and like, what do I want to do in life? The big thing I did when I was younger was I, I worked on fixing my own computer, building my computer. Um, at that time, parts were really expensive. So you didn't want to go to like Best Buy or Fry's to, to buy parts. Well, you, some parts you had to, but like you went to like swap meets and and and, and small dealers just to, just to get some parts, whatever, to build a computer. So tinkering and everything. So the engineer genesis was kind of already there. And then I think when I was in my junior year, I took a graphical arts class, which like got me a little more computers, a little more on the software. And then my senior year, I took a computer science class and coded a little bit. I'm like, oh, yep, this is what I want to do. And then, um, and then I opted for college on that. So I think the engineering side, I'd say it was always there, the tinkering of like, hey, if I need it, I will fix it and build it from there. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah. So and, now if you want, and if you want to go back even further, I love Legos. So if I pan my camera over there, which I will not, I, I love Legos. I will just <laughs> constantly build them. They're so much fun. Nice. Excellent. Well, I want to get into the, you know, we talked about Merge Cube. So I want to talk about your very first encounter with Frank and Andrew. What was that like or how did you end up meeting? Because I know that back in 2018, that's the first time that I was introduced to this mm -hmm. cube right here. And I went and I bought out, I think, three Walmarts here <laughs> in my area. So I had about 300 cubes and I still have maybe about 40 some cubes left that I have from back in the day when these were a dollar. Mm -hmm. So that was back in 2018 when I was introduced to that. So please tell me a little bit about how you were able to meet up or what led to that meeting with Andrew and Franklin, you know, and start working on something like this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so they're really, really cool. And to this day, they're really awesome down to earth. I highly advise everyone that's listening right now, if you go to an event um, and you, uh, they're probably already always there at the booth, reach out and say hi and say hello. Say, hey, this guy with long hair and with uh, some cube told me to send me here. Like definitely meet it, reach out. They're very, very cool. Uh, but the biggest thing, I met them at that one single meeting at, at, at Sony when I was working there of just like, hey, Kevin, um, there's this um, a thing called a merge cube. I researched the company, researched the cube. At the time, they were a full entertainment company. Uh, so they wanted to have like pretty much game development on it. Um, and I was, you know, working with the gaming sections in Sony Picture Entertainment with PSVR. So I did my research, came to the meeting, and I thought it was cool. So with them, I said, hey, can I have one? And they're like, yeah, like, can I code on it? And they're like, yeah, we'll have a developer send you the uh, SDK, the software development kit to code on it. And to be honest, actually, this is another fun fact. I never coded in Game Engine, especially Unity before in my life. So... I spent that whole weekend um, on uh, Saturday and Sunday building something up. And that was from Friday night, literally being at home. And my wife going, I had a rough day because she um, assesses at, at school being a social psychologist. 
And um, she goes, I am having trouble with these couple of children. I don't know what to do. And uh, I make the joke of just like, it's the first time I actually sat down and listened and paid attention to what my, what my wife said about work. Uh, Cause she said I didn't understand it, but now I'm trying to understand as an engineer. And she's like, yeah, I would love for them to just kind of just sit down um, and not move and, um, and correlate what I really want, which was feelings. And yeah, built it all weekend. Um, uh, Franklin and Andrew sent me a kit. And by um, Sunday night, I had a full dev going. I think my banner on my Twitter, might, I'd have to double check that, might be the, a prototype look of it. Um, I'll post it again and tag you on it and reference this podcast. But it's really cool. The video and up originally what I did, and she put that to use right away, got two extremely successful uh, test cases where the whole Burbank district was just like, where's this app? Where can I get it? And um, talked to me a little more and then went back to Franklin and Andrew and like, hey, I'll build, I'm going to build you a, um, a launch app, but it's going to be for like special education. And so um, I think at launch, it was a $50 app at the time, um, which some viewers might be listening like, yeah, hey, I remember when it was 50 bucks. Um, and then a couple months later, the app got acquired from a company. And then uh, due to stuff uh, we won't talk about, I got everything back a year later. Um, but yeah, um, kept up conversation with Andrew and uh, Franklin the entire time. Um, um, we, I would call them my close friends right now. Excellent. Yeah, I've actually I've had actually had the pleasure of meeting Franklin and actually Steph has been on the show. She's been a guest here like probably within my first year, maybe within the first 40 episodes. So it's been a while, you know, when once we got doing remote learning and everything like that. So she's been a guest. So they're all like you said, you describe them. They are wonderful. They are great. They're mm -hmm. so polite, so nice, so caring. And they're just always willing to help and answer questions. And, you know, I've seen them at booths and, uh, you know, got to hang out with them. And so they're great. And um, yeah. also the app, like you mentioned, I will be sharing that. All of that will be in the show notes, too, as well. You know, I am sharing uh, the link to the website so people can go visit the website. You can download it on the App Store for iOS. But what I'm going to do here also as well, Kevin, is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I actually have it downloaded. So you can tell us a little bit about the app, like you said. And I know that you said that you built this in response to a problem mm -hmm. that you're trying to find a solution to, which, which is your wife assessing, you know, students uh, for her school district. So let me go ahead and bring this up here. This Definitely. is the Moment AR app, and we will go ahead and go through the emotions first. And you can kind of walk us through at least uh, what it is that we're seeing here. Yeah, sure. So the the, the idea behind Moment, um, be and I did a recent update on it like a good year ago, whatever. The big idea is a, it's purely a talking piece, okay? There is no set rules how to use it. I remember a lot of people message me, especially when I'm on the show floor and people and I demo and they're like, how do you use it? I'm like, literally turn your camera on and point to the cube. The idea is for you to express what every emotion is. So the, there's, um, I think the five like kind of like inside out emotions that everyone's aware of, like you have anger, happy, sad, disgust. Um, I'm missing someone. Um disgust, anger, happy, no, uh, the sad, um, well, I added, a, I added a sixth one, um, which is, which is boredom uh, right there. And it pretty much covers each side of the cube. And, um, you could actually click on each emotion and it'll get to six sub emotions of that. Um, and of course this was all engineered and thought out from my wife. So, uh, one thing as a software developer, what you do, um, which is called like user focus testing, if you make sure that everything is approved and, and look. So when you're going through all the animations, you'll notice that one animation doesn't take over all the other ones. Um, her, the purpose of this is she doesn't want one um, uh, child or user to pretty much focus on one emotion. So that's one of the cool things about when it was developed is that every single animation character created, the way it was placed and whatever was all engineered and signed off by her. Um, and yeah, so the main core... A module, the emotions module, is just every emotion on each side with six sub emotions to that main emotion. So, like you're viewing anger right here. Um, you have one that's anger towards another person that's slamming the door on someone. You have anger, jealousy. You have um, anger towards oneself, anger towards another person, um, anger towards a group of people. So it kind of just spreads the emotion around. But the big idea of moment is for you to just talk. I mean, I have had people that haven't used it in the social emotional learning space that said. I don't understand the app. I just sat there and talked with my kids about it for half an hour. I'm like, one, half an hour, that's amazing. But two, it's just like you did what the, what the, the goal it was, was to talk. And, you know, one of the key things that's, that's point out a bit, um, uh, which I'll, you know, if you can link to the website or wherever, one of the core things we got initially done um, was this research. Um, one of the things I found out 
um, getting into the education space, especially in the social emotional learning space, is that without proper research, you're just an app quoting stuff from the internet. Um, so what we did was create a poster, which was amazing uh, because I have never done a poster in my entire life. Uh, but that poster, and yeah, if you go to the research section, and excuse everyone for my horrible Wix page. I'm not a web designer. But yeah, that was one that was um, submitted to the CAST, the California Association of School Psychology. And I think that was 2017. 17? Yeah, 18-ish, whichever. But um, yeah, never done um, a poster before that got accepted. And it showed three key elements um, out of the app. And it was shown in like um, a, a pool baseline between like five to eight uh, children, which was um, it showed students' response time student engagement and comments for feedback. So response time as in like, how fast are you getting answers? Students engagement of like how long they're engaged with you at one given time. Remember that I talked about earlier, my, that was one of my wife's problems was that she wanted a student or I'm sorry, a, student, a user to sit down with her and give answers instead of her chasing around or trying to use some type of toy to uh, do that. And the biggest, the key out of it is comments per session, meaning how many key words did she get out of that session that she otherwise wouldn't get. So a good example of that is, you know, maybe a kid said, I am angry and I'm angry because, you know, my parents are always mad at me. That right there is ammo for the psychologist then to further dig and deep in and get um, the assessment, which is the, the main goal of the app. Man, that is wonderful. And like you said, you know, it, it's so interesting and how powerful this can be. And, and like you said, even not knowing what the app does, but just being able to talk. And that's one thing that I love that you mentioned that the teacher had no clue what she was doing, but she got to talk for 30 minutes, you mm -hmm. know, about all of this. And that's because I didn't even really go into all the uh, extra features that the app has. And let me see if I can get that right yeah. now a little bit just so we can see the extra stuff because um, it's not, it wasn't just those scenes, but there is some additional stuff here. Yeah. Like if we go to the menu. While you're loading that up, yeah, while you're loading up, I'll, I'll verbally explain it too. So yeah. there's there's a couple of modules. There's actions, social, scalar, and custom. So the actions is all just like for languages. So it's all the emotions doing action verbs. Um, so you probably have like sun, uh, uh, happy throwing the ball, and there's kicking, and there's sleeping, and there's um, – I think that's still the first, that's the, still the first module. Yeah, those like, emotions. Yeah, the yeah. And then, and then the, uh, yeah, so you have all the, them doing action stuff. So you have discussed their reading. So um, as a developer, fun fact, I reused all the emotions instead of creating all new characters because that creating new characters and animations costs like a lot of money. So I'm just like, how about I just reuse the emotions doing it? And it kind of serves the same purpose. And you can kind of recycle feelings like, hey, why is angry right here doing jumping jacks? You know, and that becomes, a, you know, almost the language has become a talking piece there. But there's um, each um, animation is doing um, or each emotion is doing um, uh, an animation on each side. And I think there's up to 18. So there's six, um, it's six uh, three iterations, obviously one on each side. So six. So 18 total different language verbs. Um, and then there's another module on there is social, which was another request uh, from Burbank, which is I just want two people in the middle of the cube. And I want them interacting and then it's a talking piece. So it's more of like the social skills aspect of it. Like here's a good, you know, right. And obviously if you click on it, it changes it. But here's just like, hey, there's two characters and what are they doing? Like, where are they pointing at? What's the kid in the blue hat doing? What's the kid in the gray hat doing? Like, how do you think the kid in the red hat feels? Have you been, ever been like this before? It's purely just talking pieces. And there's six different um, social interactions between that one. Um, the fourth one, scalar, is the same emotions initially, but they're on like a scalar scrub bar. So if you just kind of scrub from one, two, three, five, it's a barometer of uh, of emotions on it. So if you are on disgust, maybe you're on disgust level one, and then you could scrub to a level five where you're most disgusting, which I think at level five, he's probably uh, about to throw up. So like level four is like disgust, there's something on him, and five is he's about to throw up. Um, and they, and that's the same thing with all the emotions. Like, so the same thing with anger. If you go to anger, you'll see a level one of like, he's a little bit pouty and probably a level five where he's physically going to destroy something. So, um, obviously I'm not going to put in there where he's punching a wall or hurting someone else, but you can alert to it, right? Right here's, he's kind of slamming something at level five is I'm going to physically destroy something. So it can give you some type of scale, um, a scaled out value of that emotional barometer. Um, what I like about it too, because I try to keep everything COPA compliant. There's no data um, um, uh, going in or going out, but 
you could use this as well as kind of like a daily score if you wanted to, if you're uh, checking someone's um, emotional level. Um, and the last one is um, custom. This is one of the one updates. One of the things that Moment was lacking, and the one thing I, I, I heard a lot in the social emotional learning space, especially from speech language pathologists, but also in just general education space, is the um, the idea of putting your own custom cubes on it. So you actually have an option in here to create your own cube if you wanted to, which accesses your own uh, photo library in your phone, um, and you can create your own decks as well. So. In the social emotional learning space, if you want to create your own emotions using pictures on um, all on uh, every side, you could do that. What my wife usually does is she walks around with this, uh, the user on their phone and says, "Pick, take all the pictures of that make you happy or angry or whichever," and then you could go back to and review it, and then you could save that deck for future use. Um, or you could do it in um, some type of fun education way of maybe um, uh, turning into like some map pack or something like that as well. So. That's like the, the latest update in customization. And of course, in settings, what we do have is we localize that for Spanish to English. So there's an English um, um, subtitles on it. And also, um, you can also add uh, captions and text speech on all of them as well. Man, which is this, cool. So this is very robust. This is just wonderful. And like just the, the potential that it has in, in again, Having that dialogue and, you know, working on those cues and just being able to have a student open up or even if it's a nonverbal student, maybe they just don't feel like verbalizing, but being able to at least pinpoint and say, okay, this is where I'm at. And even with the scale, uh, you know, being able to scrub, you know, one through five, this is something that is very, very powerful. Now, let me ask you, mm -hmm. currently, what is the price of this app right now? It is completely free. Uh, the only problem is it's only available on iOS. I had a couple Android users go, man, you know, and I'm like, man, I'm so sorry. The The big thing I, as an innovator and everything my, myself is, you know, how much can I push it with the Merge Cube and using some of the libraries and everything else, it was only really available on the iOS, like the text to speech and whatnot, whatever. Remember, I'm a third, I don't work for Merge. I'm a third party developer. So I got to work with whatever software development kit they give me. And to be honest, I think I'm one of maybe two or three other third-party developers out there that are live. The rest are all the internal merge team. So um, that's why, unfortunately, there was an Android out. And I think out of every 100 iOS users, I had one Android user. So it's one of those things of like, um, you know, I made a business decision there. But on iOS, as a, as a construct, it's completely free. Wow, this is very yeah. powerful. So for anybody that's watching and all our viewers that are going to be catching this show at a later time, please make sure you check out those links. And make sure you check out this amazing app because it could be something that could be a game changer for anybody at your school and just to be able to just even spark those conversations. And really, also, I love the fact that you actually have a link there to actually print out a cube yeah. if you don't have one of these. So that also right there is a game changer. So don't feel like, oh my gosh, I don't have a cube. This isn't going to work. You do have the option of being able to print out a cube and making it available to, you know, either as a class set or if you just want one and then just project your, uh, your device onto the projector and then just have those discussions. You know, that's something that's wonderful. And I can definitely see how great this could be for, you know, students and Again, the importance of opening up those dialogues. And again, sometimes students may not feel like speaking, but you can still be able to reach out to them and they can still communicate what they're feeling. And so this is, wow, like this, this is amazing. So your wife has the solution maker here at home. <laughs> and I still can't believe that you said this started on a Friday. You listened to her and by Sunday, you already had something for her ready to go and did you expect this kind of traction right away? Yeah, I didn't think so because I remember when she called me after the uh, the child that she wanted it for and used it and got success. I think after like six minutes, got a whole bunch of, I, I can't be specific, but got the answer she wanted. I was like, cool. But as a programmer and developer, like one successful test case means nothing. Like you have to tell me like a hundred times, whatever. But after the second one, and it was a pretty big one, uh, where like it was uh, pretty much she was able to positively uh, positively assess. Um, then I was just like, I think we got something here. Why don't you talk to all your colleagues and see what's up? And then it kind of, you know, ex exploded from there. So um, one thing I, I did want to note, though, that's very, very important, which 
I know in the education space is important, but in the special education, it's extremely important. Mo Moment as of last year is now patent approved. It got patent approved due to um, uh, the whole methodology and everything of it. So if you're looking deep dive in the research, I think I have in my research page of not only do I have video clinical testimony of it, but I have the white paper, which led into the patent, which I showed, which I have links to the patent as well. So um, yeah, I have everything on there too. I know, uh, especially in, in the SEL space, it's very big to prove out what you talk about. And um, I'll just say like, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> That's the one thing I'll say. I'm like, oh, it didn't happen. Just like, oh, we did a poster and we got a patent. Like that, it, that took a good three to four, I think the a patent submission by 2018 and last year. So it took almost four years. I'm pretty sure COVID probably delayed something, but um, I was able to get something 2021 of a first initial review, had to modify it. And uh, that it got approved, but um, yeah, all the research and everything is there. And, and there's a couple of clin um, one clinical trial, I think, posted on there as well. So tons of research there for you to read on. So for those of you that um, maybe aren't touching SEL, you're like, hey, I'm going to give it to my professional in my school, whatever. Definitely, like I said, you could print out the cube. Um, the app is free, and then pepper them with research. And of course, you can reach out to me. Um, unfortunately, the cubes aren't a buck anymore, like at Walmart, like yeah. Alfonso mentioned in the <laughs> beginning. And so they're, I think, maybe fifty. 15 to 20, but you could print out a paper one to see if you like it. And of course, there's a whole bunch of fabulous content from uh, Merge's side as well. Yeah, and here's an example of a paper cube. So we've got that. So that's what you can get that you can print out. And of course, you are got so the funny cube right there. I yeah. got one right near my desk <laughs> just for these, for this specific one. Here, yeah. if anything, you could see that I just taped it real quick. Mm -hmm. And see, this, this is why you want the real cube because look, I just squeeze it and thing popped out, but it'll give you what you want to do. And if you are, really loving it you can find it on amazon or maybe you can find people that are offloading the original dollar um cubes i don't know i think i think everyone bought those out now so yeah for sure but hey you know what glue stick works really good <laughs> <laughs> glue stick works really good and of course yeah. you got this one right here as well but you know this is amazing and and again you know when i first saw this i even and you know huge fan like i said thanks to jamie donnelly as well you mm -hmm. know with arvr and edu uh, you know the chats i know no the chats aren't happening anymore i know she's very busy but you know she was all she shared it i remember we actually did a twitter chat on it and everything it was just amazing and just the work that you've done and what you continue to do and what this app continues to provide something that's amazing. And like you said, for the SEL space and you've got, you know, special education and, you know, very well thought of and there's research. And one thing that I love, it's like, you can definitely sprinkle it on to what you're already doing. Great teachers. And of course, mm -hmm. even Kevin, you know, offered to listen in case you have any questions as well. So that's wonderful. So you make sure you check out that link as well. So now Kevin, I kind of just want to change and then steer the conversation a little bit. So now with your experience here, programming, you know, your experience writing, for merge and you're seeing obviously the innovation in AR VR. We saw, of course, Meta, you know, of course, coming out with their goggles, and then now they've got the new goggles coming out. You've got, you know, P every, pretty much essentially, you know, a lot of big players in the AR VR space. So mm -hmm. through your experience, through your lens, and through the access that you have, where do you see this technology continuing to move forward and leading into? It may be in 2023. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Well, you know, the problem with Moment years ago of like, where do I want to build this on or whatever was, hey, you can get this for 15 bucks and everyone has a phone and boom, you're in augmented reality, you're done. Where at the time, I think a Vive Pro, which I have over here was like, what, a couple thousand dollars. And I'm like, there's no psychologist going to get a budget for that. And there's not even a budget for you for... Uh, anything less and, and they have to put it on a, a, a child's head you know so it's probably like they have like some legal issues they have to work out with or whichever but you know the big thing i'm seeing is just like it's a little more portable you know i uh in real glasses which i was impressed with i think i saw them on amazon like on sale for like a couple not a couple hundred but like three to five hundred bucks and i'm like i could see that being you just hey it's just glasses like anything else not a whole headset i have to put on so I think as time moves on, the portability, feasibility, accessibility mixed in with a really good price point, you're going to see more developers like me, like go, okay, like, you know, there's 30,000 users that might make sense. You know, that's why you're seeing a lot of more enterprise stuff because, um, you know, um, still businesses have to make money, you know, but um, I, I think with that nature of just like having that in more, more people's hands and uh, you can do a combo of it of a software and hardware. I think you'll see more adoption from there. So 
I would say in the AR VR space, it's it's exciting times to the fact, much different than five years ago. Oh yeah, most definitely. But like I said, you know, having these, I mean, everybody's got their hands on one of these, whether it's yeah. iOS or Android, they all have, sometimes they'll have, you know, the same app for both, but the access is there. And oftentimes I feel like even as educators, there, there's always kind of like a slight disconnect because what happens is I know that, you know, many of my co colleagues or friends, they'll go out to the movie theater and they'll scan a poster and they'll see, you know, something like an AR, VR. But then when we come back and, you know, we're in our natural setting in our school and they're like, oh, no, no, that would never work here. And nobody uses AR, VR. I was like, wait a minute. Didn't you go watch that movie? And didn't you say <laughs> you scan this and do that? And they're like, oh. Like they, they kind of don't make that connection, you know, with education. And of course, one of the things, like you said, it's just the access, the money. Of course, CTOs don't like it because it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to open up this account or, you know, obviously the age restrictions on those. And interoperability is something that's huge, too, as well. We want to make sure that, you know, students get access pretty much on any device. That would be great. So even though there's still a lot of work to do, I am very excited and I've been very excited about this space since 2018 and we still continue to see it grow. And of course, with all the talk of the metaverse and we're talking about digital universities, I know we kind of talked a little bit pre-chat and I don't know mm -hmm. how much you can share because I know it's part of your work, but mm -hmm. if maybe you can kind of share a little bit about maybe some of the, the projects that you were uh, or you were asked to do for the university that you're working for, whatever little bit you can share would be okay. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, piggybacking off our previous thing about AR, VR and accessibility, you know, where it was just like um, Cal State Northridge has a VR training kind of uh, software that they use and whatnot. Everything's, everything's great, but they want their own kind of custom functions into it. Uh, really, really specific. And I got some of my graduates, we got together and kind of built a prototype. And now it's like a full fledged working um, thing. Uh, kudos to them. We built it all over the summer. It's one of those things they graduated. And I'm like, well, the job hunting right now is a little rough <laughs> due to recession and everything. But I'm like, projects look amazing on the resume. And so uh, we got that delivered that and they were still hungry looking for more, kind of looking for a little more public and um, uh, we kind of have another app that's more of like a entertainment gaming app that has a big education side. So you'll probably hear something from that come another month. It's not AR VR, uh, but the biggest thing is that it can use media assets. Uh, it gamifies media assets, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, and then uh, professional side, um, I've I strangely have been in contact by a lot of NFT uh, companies doing a lot of NFT work. Uh, people want to do something innovative or piggyback off something else. Um, and since I've kind of known for building something from scratch, like, you know, moment and other stuff and, and making products out of it, that's where, that's where I get a lot of my work from. So let's talk a little bit about that experience and what your thoughts are. I know that with last year, you know, this last year, there's a huge boom, NFT boom. Everybody seemed like they were dropping NFTs like crazy mm -hmm. and so on. And of course we know we see the news, we see a lot of stuff that's happening and that kind of just causes that caution in some people like i i'm a big fan i own some nfts i find that there is going to be some utility in that in the future once everything kind of settles down and you know can be great but what are your thoughts and and again i know that maybe you know as a builder you have your thoughts on that you know it's work but overall your thoughts about the nft space and maybe a little bit about the metaverse what are your thoughts on that yeah, I mean, you know, it's so funny. I joked um, uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine of like, I, I'm like, the metaverse kind of existed forever. I'm like, if you played MMORPGs like World of Warcraft and Star Wars Galaxies, I'm really dating myself there. But I'm like, it was kind of like persistent rules that you lived in and built houses and other stuff. And, and so um, I just think with, you know, the metaverse and um, NFTs and everything, it's you know, you have to go through like the FOMO stage, you know, because unfortunately things are a business and that's what the first round of NFTs went of like, like we're going to sell, we're going to make money and then move on. I think now we're getting into, um, you know, where people understanding it, people know about gas fees and, you know, how to, how it makes money and whatnot. You're seeing a lot more synergy and business dev play out of it, you know? So like, you know, Warner Brothers has, so you buy the NFT bat cowl um, and like it only works with, um, if you had that um, NFT, you could, um, you could only use that snap and snap and you can only be use the first access to exclusive store so there's a business synergy around it, and i think that's that's clever as well and um you know i'm business advisor for a company called uh five hit games and they're coming out with an nft game 
in another month. And that makes a lot of sense to me too, because I used to collect baseball cards when I was a kid, you know, and baseball cards are worth money the longer you have them. The law of supply and demand. And kind of the same thing with digital card games when I'm playing um, uh, games like Hearthstone or, or, or Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever, like after I buy, you know, play the digital one and after a year and if the season one is obsolete, it kind of just ends there where if you turn those into NFTs, it kind of has the same rules as a baseball card and, or any other Magic the Gathering cards or whatever, which is like, hey, like they don't make them anymore, they're legacy and now they're worth money. So I just think you're just in a transition of the people understanding and now what, you know, what it's its true value, which I think NFTs have a lot of cool stuff into it, especially with the business energy side. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things right now, I know that it's it's huge on the business side of things, but there are a couple of educators that are really trying to bring at the, you know, the use of NFT and just to have educators see the potential that something like, you know, NFTs have Web3 into the K-12 space. So now I know you work in higher ed, but maybe, you know, you may hear from your colleagues or maybe some friends and maybe people that you know that are in the K-12 space. I would love to get your perspective and maybe your thoughts of what you hear from them as far as NFTs, Web3, making it into the K-12 space. Is there like a fear? Is there kind of like, ah, eh, that'll never work? Or like, hey, yeah, we're trying or, yeah, this isn't for us. What are what are you hearing? Yeah, if anything, I think that there's, you're going to see a big leap in the K-12 through due to the fact that not only are it teach you about the latest technologies and also the future technologies, but also it teaches you what's the future of what financing looks like or, or what it means to fit that. So it's almost like the genesis of education before you get into that, right? So before I go into like crypto coding, I need to understand how that works and how the back end works and like the, you know, the high level of that. So I think you're going to see next year, um, and I know that because it, I might be working with a couple of them, is that you're going to see a lot of things come out, which is like maybe a gamification version or maybe like a fun art version or something like that, where, you know, K through five at the very minimum is you're going to get some very basic things of like how to create an NFT or how some basic things of like, how do financials work in empty market? And they're going to gamify it so you can understand it. So they're not going to like open up, you see algorithms and like there's, you know, um, laws of supply and demand, all this other stuff. It's going to be more gamification version. But then it gives more them an access to to um, to that subject matter and and how to uh, firmly understand it so that when you move up the ladder, so from K-5, then go closer to 12 and then slowly into um, college, you kind of get a better grasp. And since you've had that taste and some familiarity of it, you might want to get into that subject. So it endorses you to get into that subject matter later on in life. So I 300% know and guarantee that you are going to see it in the space and you're going to see multiple flavors of it, which is exciting as long as it's it's done right. You know what I'm saying? It's not just like, hey, we built it because, you know, your kids are going to like it. Like, no, we're like, again, what I've learned from Moment, like it's trial tested, school tested, it's approved and you have some data on it. I think you'll definitely see that. That's perfect. And that's exciting. And that excites me, you know, hearing that because oftentimes it's like there there isn't enough information out there. And of course, mm -hmm. Teachers will go just with, oh, no, well, this is what I hear in the news. And then, of course, they close themselves off. But, you know, I think that we don't give enough benefit of the doubt to some of our students. I mean, like you said, you you yourself saying how big of a gamer you were and playing, you know, World of Warcraft and you're playing all these games. But also the students, you know, playing Minecraft, playing Fortnite, playing Roblox. I mean, they they know what digital assets are. Maybe they may not know it in, you know, the the standard, you know, verbiage and, you know, what we as adults talk about and the business side of the NFTs, but they have that concept and they are a little bit familiar with those concepts. But uh, so I'm really excited. And especially with you telling me this, that I'm really looking forward to that because uh, it's just like I said, it, it's always preparing for the future of work, you know, and the future of learning. And, you know, Web3 is here. And of course, NFT space can also make some, uh, you know, big uh, change and you know, just really just spice up education in the K-12 space. I mean, this last week, yeah. every, every buddy is like chat GP over. We were, that's it. Writing is over. Teaching is done. AI is taking over. I was like, oh, come on, like, let's learn how to navigate this. You know, I was like, back in my day, my chat GPT was Encyclopedia Britannica when I had to get dropped off at the the library. And I can yeah. tell you this right now, I would have to open up that encyclopedia and I was just, copying word for word because yeah. who's going to go check, you know, and now let's 
not catch them or make it like an I gotcha moment, but let's teach them how to use this technology responsibly. So what are your thoughts on some of this, uh, you know, from chat GPT this last week and a half that uh, came out? Oh, man, um, I want to respond to a whole bunch of things. But one of the things I will say is regarding like the chat GPT is, you know, and I, I was actually in a, another podcast talking about AI and, and machine learning, and everything. And, and the one thing I'll say is like, you know, teachers have a have it hard, you know, and I teach Cal State North, uh, Northridge at college level. So I can't attest to K through 12, but I would tell people like Lisa pays me for 10 hours and I work 40. You know, I'm like, I'm not even teaching right now. And I talk to students probably five to 10 times a day about careers, resumes and everything. So it's, I think it's the like adaptation part of just like, you know, learning how they work and then I'm able to adapt to them. So like, I might be one of the few professors that we run everything through discord. Like, you know, there is no office hours. No, just ping me on discord. I'll talk to you whenever you want. Like that's, that's old school, you know, but one of the things that I was started teaching was due to the fact of COVID since everything was remote. Um, a lot of the professors couldn't adapt to that. So a lot of them opt for early retirement and then that puts what brought me in. So, you know, when you bring things like chat GPT in, I would just say, well, I'm like, um, um, if your final was to write a paper and all they could do is at 1155, type it in and get a full paper within seconds and then submit it. Um, I'd say you probably have maybe have to like change up the final a little bit, meaning like instead of just reading that paper, maybe you just read it and they have to explain full, it fully explain you quiz them on it because most students then are just going to like turn it in and be like, cool, yep, I get wrote you the perfect paper and they're going to go back to playing games or sleeping or whatever, whatever they're doing. But if you quiz them on it, then you can, you know, there's a gotcha. So I think there's things like that you could probably a adapt to it. But then, you know, you're just asking for teachers to do more work of changing curriculums, whatever. So to every situation, a potato, potato, but I think it's really cool. You know, um, I, from, as a coder, I told my students, I'm like, you know, you're taught to like write your own code and do everything from scratch, but when you get in the real world, you're going to be like Googling how to do certain things, whatever, and then try to make the code your own and like just making sure what's the wrong way and right way of doing things like that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, me personally, I don't, I don't knock anything of it, but I could totally see the very negative side of it. And, you know, it's kind of scary. It's back to where it says, Hey, a robot will take over your job. And it, you know, it was sci-fi at the time, but then you know, we were at close enough where, I mean, isn't there like pizza vending machines now where you can yeah. like go and make a perfect pizza? And I'm like, isn't that just replaces a restaurant, you know, but, um, you know, but because of that, how many jobs did it open up just for engineering robotics and stuff right there? So yeah, I think this is just a, a discussion that's not going to go away. It's still in the shock phase, but once it, people just welcome it and adapt to it, I think you'll, you know, people get some clear cut answers, almost like with NFTs launch, right? Everyone just made yeah. money. Like, how do I do it? I'm just going to copy them. And when start, people started losing money, they're like, this NFTs are terrible. Tell it to Fox News and tell everyone the NFTs terrible, which I'm like, okay, well, now we got to adapt and move on to the next phase mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Or even when the internet, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, now they've got Google. Now they're just going to type in and they're going to go ahead. I was like, okay, isn't it the kind of the same thing? And we're yeah. still using Google. <laughs> we're still using it. So it's like you said, it's just adapt and things change but i'm really excited like i said you know the k-12 space and it is definitely going to change and uh, you know one thing that i did notice is coming back from pandemic is like the higher ed space seemed to have been like just took a huge leap forward and was just doing some amazing things and right now even in the ar vr space like things that i'm seeing so that are so innovative and then now I'm like, man, when is the K-12 space going to catch up? Like before, I felt like we were ahead being very innovative. And then, of course, like you mentioned, you know, you have those professors that were very old school that couldn't yeah. adapt. And now we've got professors like you now that this is what you grew up in and you're able to adapt. You're able to improvise depending on the situation. And I think that just makes it very exciting where we also need those teachers in the K-12 space just to just like. I don't know, just be, get excited about this. And I know it takes time, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. <laughs> the one thing I'll add to it as well is the one thing I tell people is like, I thought being a post-production engineer was a, a hard job, but I'd say creating a business in education is extremely, extremely, extremely hard. Um, you have to know the lay of the land before you do anything. And, and the sad part of it is just like what I've been in this space like for four or five years now. And there's a lot of companies I know that just failed just due to the fact of just like couldn't get a district to pay for it or couldn't get adoption or whichever. And it's just like it's one of those stories of just like you, you hear that and, and go out. So 
maybe it's not it i think it's a mixture of you know a teachers themselves having to adapt but also like do they have all the tools ready to available like you mentioned jamie donnelly does an amazing job of showing off tools but what's going to happen if nobody used those tools or if it's just doesn't mesh well with them um you know i don't know how to answer that but that's one thing i noticed from i would say the business side is you know people creating tools but having that adoption to it you know is 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 a crazy thing luckily for me i do well or moment um you know got acquired and then i got it back and i released it for free so I'm, I'm in the cool boat of it but i'm like let's say no one bought it and i had to just take it off from the store and then we would never be talking about it. it'd be legacy information now so um that's the one thing i you know um I tell educators that the you know we as business and companies we listen a lot, but it, it's extremely difficult. So if you don't have a tool or something now, like it'll come. It's just patience is extremely key because unfortunately, in the end, things do cost money. So um, that's the one thing I kind of like throw my specific Kevin Chai insight on. Nice, excellent. Well, Kevin, it's been an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you, thank you so much for your time and just sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience, sharing moment with us and the work that you've done through that. It's been just amazing. So a lot of great sound bites in this uh, conversation that I'm excited to share and with everybody to continue to promote the show. But before we go, Kevin, if you can tell our audience members what would be the easiest way for them to maybe get a hold of you if they have some questions, you know, on what we talked about today. Yeah, you know, I have my main email. I used to have like five emails and then I stopped checking four out of them because I'm lazy. Um, you can you always email me at kchaya at gmail.com. Um, and then also on Twitter, I'm L-E-L underscore C-H-A-K-K-A uh, at twitter.com. Um, and actually my pinned tweet is actually by a full demo to moment, which is awesome. So reach me out on Twitter or on email is perfect. And I'm usually, um, usually parked right here in front of my computer. Uh, so I'll be able to chat. Perfect. Excellent. All right, Kevin. But before we go, I always love to end the show with these last three mm. questions. So here we, we go. It. Question number one, Ooh. in the current state of, we'll go with AR, VR, since this is what we talked about. In mm -hmm. the current state of AR, VR, what would you say is your current kryptonite? Kryptonite? Well, I would say the kryptonite is the business side of it. It's just, uh, if I build something, does it get adopted? And do I have long longevity? Good example is um, I'm only one man. I'm unfortunately, if I've been able to grow more arms, I'm able to code a lot more, but I only have two and I'm a horrible coder. So I rely on third party uh, uh, people to code and that costs money. So what I'm able to build is is just like, it, is it successful or not? You know, And like I said, in the education space is difficult. So my kryptonite is building stuff in AR that gets adopted and um, that it can prolong and move more off of it and turn into like a successful business. So. That would be like a unique kind of kryptonite, like the business part portion of it. Okay, perfect. Good answer. Good answer. All right, Kevin. Question number two. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Um, you know what? I'm gonna be completely honest here, and it's gonna sound taboo or weird, and hopefully it doesn't strike anything up. I would say teachers aren't paid enough. I would have a billboard that literally says teachers aren't paid enough. And if anyone ever complains about that, I would be like, be a teacher yourself. And after one semester or what, how long it is, they will 3,000% agree with you. Excellent. Good yeah. billboard. I agree with you I, on yeah. that. All right. Question number three. Let's say that this was your podcast and I got to be a guest. What would be one question you'd like to ask me? Well, my first question is, why is your background way better than my horrible background of random trash? Actually, that's a green screen right there. I think there's a Lego set right over there. But, oh. My one would be, and I think I asked this a lot of people, and I think I recently just asked it a month ago when I launched the alpha version of a new app I'm building, is what are you looking for as an educator? So if this was my show and I was, uh, I called the Kevin Chaya app building hour, and I'm going to build an app and I called in callers and, and Alfonso pops up and you're like, I need what? This is what's missing, go. Uh, so I would need an app that, it, well, actually, all right, an ARVR app. That could be easily accessible either on iOS or Android, but that would allow our math teachers to feel a little bit more comfortable using manipulatives. And I know I said strictly math, but this could be cross-curricular because I know with science too, we can be hands-on, but it was something that would be a little bit more affordable where you wouldn't need a huge headpiece and that it would be standards aligned 
to what Texas has, because I know a lot of apps come in and they want to sell stuff, but it's not really aligned to a specific curriculum. So that would be my spiel on that, on what I would be looking for. Okay. I like that. I like you. The, the key portion of that is you just want an app, just build it, but I want it to be curriculum aligned as yes. in like, um, it's right like, to the ringer. So yeah. yeah. Standards aligned. That's the thing. And, and that's the thing in Texas, just hint, hint for any companies. To, wait, wait, if you want to sell in Texas, make sure you are Teeks aligned and you do have your research. Like Kevin has his research on the website, then you'll probably get your foot in the door a little bit more. So just throwing that out there just from personal experience. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Kevin. Well, thank you so much again, as always. Uh, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much for all your wonderful answers, your enthusiasm, your authenticity, your genuineness. I really appreciate it. And of course, thank you, you know, for your friendship and just being able to, you know, know each other in this space for a while. But actually, the first time that we have a nice long conversation like this. I really enjoyed it. And like I mentioned earlier in the pre-chat, you're always welcome back. So I know you've got a lot of projects that you'll be working on. So anytime you're ready to, you know, come and share those projects and those projects go live, you always have an open invite. So thank you so much. And for all our audience members, thank you as always for making My EdTech Life what it is today. Please make sure you stop by our website at myedtech.life, myedtech.life, where you can go ahead and check out this amazing episode and the other 154 episodes with amazing educators and creators that you can go ahead and dive in and take something that you learned from that podcast, sprinkle it on to what you already doing great. And just get excited about education once again. Please make sure that you also stop by our store and you can help support our mission by contributing to our, excuse me, by contributing our, to our mission of connecting educators and creators one show at a time. We've got some great designs that you can stop by and just check out. We've got cap sweaters. So please make sure that you stop by and of course, continue to support our show. But as always, my friends, until next time, don't forget, stay techie.